Welcome to East Brainerd, everybody. Be coming on in and finding a seat if you are outside in our foyer area. Come on in, find a seat. Premium seating down front. The no splash zone is available, so you may come on down. Enjoy that. So glad that you are here with us this morning at East Brainerd. Thank you for getting up. Thank you for getting ready, for coming, and for joining us today. Hope that everyone picked up a glory, praise, and honor. I know that there were a lot of smiling faces as you were coming in the door that had one of these in their hand, and they were hoping that you would take one. There's a lot of information on the inside that we want you to go ahead and uh, read through, find out different things that are going on here with our family, and we would love for you to know as much information as possible and for you to be able to be involved in as many things as you can that are taking place here at East Brainerd. On the inside of our glory, praise, and honor, you'll find a tear out. If you would look on that, please, just a moment, because there is a new box on the tear out. For those of you who are normally with us here, on the welcome member side, right above the Wednesday night meal, it says, yes, I would be interested in receiving text notifications. Uh, we are looking into uh, new and different avenues in order to be able to communicate more effectively. And if you are a texter, if this is something that you do on a regular basis and you'd be interested in receiving text notifications such as uh, information when it comes to uh, time changes, when it comes to uh, important news and information regarding the body here, then go ahead and make it known. Put a little check on that. We would greatly appreciate it. And then fill out the rest of the information. If you are visiting with us today, there's the other side that says welcome guest. We just ask that you... Uh, if you would not mind to complete that information, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. And there's also uh, different areas on here where you can let the church staff, let the elders of the congregation here know different information that might be important to you. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, Prophet's Playhouse. Uh, this is something that is uh, very important to our third, fourth, and fifth graders. Uh, for the last quarter, they have been getting together on Wednesday evenings and uh, preparing skits based on different biblical stories. Last week they went to the Martin Boyd home and had a devotional time with the residents there and also were able to deliver their skits. This evening they're going to be here. This will be at six o'clock. We'll have a devotional time together and following that period of worship we'll enjoy the skits that they have prepared. And so we want moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, meemaws, papas, aunts and uncles and strangers. Come on out and enjoy time with our third, fourth, and fifth graders uh, tonight. You can see here on the stage that uh, we are trying to fill the stage with supplies for the Tennessee Children's Home. We have two more weeks available for this, so two more weeks to get all of the different supplies in order that we might be able to be ready on the 28th. That is the date that the truck is going to be here to pick up everything and to carry it off. And so we want to make sure that we have this area filled so you have two more weeks to be involved in that. One last housekeeping note, parents. If you have children middle school and high school age, there is a very important meeting immediately after our Bible class time this morning that you need to have in the youth room with Josh Bontrager so that he can pass along some very important information to you. So thankful that everybody is here. We're going to be enjoying periods of song today, pausing for times of prayer and reflection going to be enjoying time of communion with one another and with God. We'll open up God's Word in a few minutes and drink deeply from the Spirit. We're so thankful that you are here today, and we hope that the time that we spend together will change our lives for the week that is to come. David. This morning as we start our worship, I'll be reading from Psalms 95, verses 1 through 7. And at the conclusion of the reading, I'd ask you to stand as we begin our singing. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock 
under his care. Come, let us worship and sing this song because my voice is is awful yeah oh well that's the wrong song number one <laughs> okay 154 in your song books once again I have been absolutely uh, undone by technology 154, and, and, and I do apologize for my voice this morning, because my voice is in really, really bad shape. Worship the Lord in the Okay, let's uh, let's move on from that one because uh, I, I I really apologize. <clears throat> I didn't realize I had no range in the upper part of my voice. I've been having some problems this week, but I've been singing and everything was okay. And suddenly this morning, uh, I would really be a great Tennessee Ernie Ford today. But you know, uh, so if if I can't get through this next song, uh, I may have to get. Uh, uh, Josh to come up and uh, pinch hit for me. I, again, I apologize. It's, uh, it's a struggle this morning for some reason. We place you on the Oh, beautiful Jesus, Jesus. 
Let's pray. Holy Father, what a privilege it is to call you Father. You make us yours. You give us our true identities in you, Lord. And we praise you for that. We thank you for that. We bless you for that. God, we ask that uh, your kingdom come and your will be done on this earth as you would have it done in heaven, Lord. Uh, we pray that you um, that your kingdom works in, in every one of our lives, that you open our hearts to your kingdom reign, that, uh, that you will be sovereign in our lives in everything that we do. God, we also pray that uh, you send out workers, workers in, in your harvest field where you've already been plowing and tilling the soil, Lord, just send workers to go and and to continue to work and join you in that work, Lord, and, and um, create the spirit of, uh, of willingness, of desire, of love in each one of our lives that we can have our eyes open to the harvest around us, the people that we relate to and that come in contact with, Lord, on a day-to-day -day basis, that we we recognize the way you're working in their lives and that we draw attention to that, Lord, and show them uh, your son. God, we, we're thankful for the blessings of life that you've given us, our, our food, our water, our clothing, our housing. Uh, God, our, our families, our relationships. Lord, we just uh, we thank you for those things. We recognize that you are our sustainer. You're the one that provides for us and gives us rest and fills all of the needs that, that we have, both physically and spiritually, God. God, forgive us from the times that we uh, don't recognize you as the Lord of our lives, that we act in ways that are not pleasing to you and do not reflect who you are. Um, Lord, those ways that uh, you would have us not do because they're life-taking away, that they rob us from life, God. And I just pray uh, for forgiveness. Give us a willing heart to... to change our lives and to be open to you in our lives. Just protect us from this world, a world that is not friendly and kind to, to Christians, people that love and love each other. And so give us strength and protect us, Lord. Be with all those in this body that are sick. Uh, you can heal all things, and we just pray for your healing. Be with all those that are struggling with um, losses, in their families, Lord, we pray for comfort and healing there. Uh, and just be with us all this week and help us to, to gain strength from being with each other today and encouraging each other as we praise and worship you. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread, which represents the flesh of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that we will take of this in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Lord, we come to you again so thankful for your son's sacrifice on the cross. We ask that you bless this cup and, and that we take of it in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Lord, we are so thankful for all the materials and the resources that you have blessed us with. Lord, I thank you that you have counted us as faithful stewards of the financial resources that you have blessed us with. I ask that you bless and multiply our offering and help us to be mindful that you will always, always provide and take care of our needs. Amen. In John chapter 5, there's a story of a man who uh, was laying at the pool there by the uh, gate of Bethesda, the sheep gate. And Jesus walked by and he saw the man and he said, do you want to get well? And I've always been fascinated that the man never answered Jesus' question. He just made some kind of statement to the effect that, well, you know, I don't have anybody to help me get in the water when it's stirred because there was this thinking that uh, you'd be healed if you were the first one in the water when it, when it bubbled. And that was his answer. He didn't really answer the question yes or no. And a lot of times on television when you see interviews and you'll have the, the person doing the interview ask a question and the person will give some lengthy, lengthy response, but it's not an answer to the question. Why didn't this man say, yes, I want to get well? I've thought about this, and there's a lot of reasons maybe, but one of the things that I think, as I, was, as I saw the topic for Chris's lesson, I have no idea which direction he's going, but when we talk about being healed, we talk about not only the healing, but there is an attitude change. There is something that changes in our life when we become healed. And maybe this man was afraid of being healed because his life was going to change, and he was afraid of that. So we're going to pray about that this morning. 
A lot of us have been praying for healing, but I also think that we need to be uh, thinking about what will the healing change in my life? How will my life be different if God provides this healing, whether it's spiritual or physical or mental or whatever? So we're going to pray about that. Let's bow, please. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for being able to talk to you uh, through prayer. It gives us a peace and a calm that nothing else can. Father, we come to you this morning realizing that we ask you so many times for healing. We ask for so many things to be changed in our lives. But Father, do we really want the change? Can we accept the change if you give it? Help us, Father, to not be timid about the healing that you would provide, but help us, Father, to embrace it and to use it to your glory. Father, we, we have so many who, who are hurting for various reasons, through physical ailment, through family issues, through spiritual problems, and we just ask, Father, that that you hear these prayers for healing and that you grant that. The Father, that you also give each one of us the ability to deal with the healing. Give us the attitude that we need to move forward, to not be afraid to answer the question, yes, I want to get well. We love you so much and we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for his blood that cleanses our sins. We ask you, Father, to embolden us with the drive and the spirit to go out and proclaim the greatness of your gospel. We love you and please forgive us when we fall short and fail you. Give us the strength and courage to pick ourselves up and to move toward you and not away from you. Your son's name we pray. Amen. We'd like to dismiss the children, the kids' praise, and we worship at this time. And while they're leaving, I'd like to uh, mention to you that on May the 13th is the fifth annual Greater Chattanooga Christian Services Golf Marathon. Parker has uh, committed to doing this again for the fifth year. And he, has, uh, he finishes classes on the 10th, uh, comes home on the 11th, and then uh, he's going to do the marathon on the 13th and has to be in New Jersey at his internship on the 14th. So uh, we're just thrilled to death that he's committed a whole day of one of his few precious days off for this, this event. As many of you know, I won't, I won't go into all the details, but GCCS is such a good organization because it provides family counseling, marriage counseling, it provides uh, uh, foster care for children, Christian family adoptions, uh, so many good works. Uh, this past year we have also added financial counseling as one of the areas that we're working in and we're trying to find ways uh, to bring other services to through GCCS that can help the community and help our brothers and sisters with their struggles. It's a great, great opportunity uh, for you to help by supporting Parker in this golf marathon. Uh, I, I'm, I don't think we have sign-up sheets in the classes today because I was supposed to get that done and I didn't. But they'll be there next week. And uh, please uh, read through the letter and, and support this great work. Thank you. Before Chris comes and speaks to us about this healing that takes place in John chapter 5, let's stand up and we're going to sing, I love the Lord. I love the Lord, for he died by soul to save. On Halloween, his delight he freed me.
standing if you would please. Father we thank you so much for bringing us here today. We praise you for your love, for your goodness, for your grace and for your mercy. Father we ask that your healing be upon us. We struggle, we mourn. Father we are crippled, we are weak, we are blind and we ask, we beg you, heal us. Make us well. We thank you for your love and the healing that it brings. In the name of your Son we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I am really glad that you are here this morning because God sometimes does crazy things in church. Don't know if you've ever thought about that. Don't know if you have looked at church in the past as just being a place where you just kind of come and sit and turn it on neutral and just kind of coast through, if, if that's kind of been your mindset, then I, I hope that maybe today opens up a new perspective for you, because God likes to do some crazy things when His people come together. Case in point, it's Sabbath day. We're in the synagogue, and there sitting amongst us is a man whose hand does not work his hand does not work. We don't know why. Perhaps it had been caught underneath the wagon cart. As he bent down to remove a stone and the ox lurched and the wagon rolled and his hand was crushed. And ever since then, he's had to keep it close to him because there's just no use. Maybe it was cut at some point in time. It was just a minor thing, but there was dirt and there was infection and and now it just sits there, withered and useless. Now your eyes are not on this man, your eyes are on Jesus. Because Jesus is in your midst and Jesus is, is teaching. But Jesus' eyes are on this man. And Jesus' eyes are on the eyes of the religious that are in the room. Because they're watching him. You're watching him. To see if he is going to do 
the unthinkable. Will he actually heal this man? You're in synagogue. Your eyes are on Jesus. You don't see the woman who is bent over back there in the corner. You don't see her because she blends in with everybody else that's in the crowd. She tries to keep to herself. For 18 years, she has been unable to stand upright. Did she stumble and fall at one point in time as she was turning to say goodbye to a friend and then end up not being able to stand again? Is there some arthritis that is killing her bones? You don't see her, but Jesus does. Jesus' eyes are on her, and he recognizes what's truly taking place. He recognizes that what is going on can only be from Satan himself. Your eyes don't see her. Your eyes are on Jesus, but Jesus sees her. There are other eyes in the room. The eyes of the religious. Their eyes are on Jesus too. And they want to know, is He going to do the unthinkable? Is He going to heal this woman in the middle of church? He does. He does. And because He heals the man, because He heals the woman, Everybody is in an uproar, but perhaps no one is affected more than that man and that woman. Because you need to understand, they didn't come to church looking to be healed. They didn't come asking for anything to be different. They showed up to listen to the rabbi. They came to offer praise to their God. But they expected to leave in the same fashion that they came. Because they had become so used to their condition. How strong is that man's healthy side? How much could he do with his good hand, his good arm? Because for so long now, he's been giving to that side. He's been strengthening those muscles because he's helpless on the other side. For 18 years, the woman had learned to adjust. No, she couldn't pick up her grandchildren anymore, but she was still able to spend time with them. She was still able to talk with them, still able to have some type of interaction. It took her longer now to go to the well. She wasn't able to do the things around the house that she used to do in the same fashion, at the same speed, at the same level, but she managed. They're used to it. They've compensated. And now Jesus has stepped in. And He's messed everything up. Because now the man can use his hand and the woman can stand up straight. Restoration has come to their life. And when restoration comes, it just messes everything up. Because think about this for a minute, guys. Restoration doesn't need doing. Restoration is fixing something that's broken, but it's been broken for so long that it's almost mended. This man, this woman that is here in our midst, they have learned how to compensate. They have learned how to continue on. They have learned how to live. They've found replacements. They understand what it means to no longer be whole. In fact, you know what they've done? They have built their whole lives around the fact that they are not whole. They've learned to live this way. They've accepted it. Because the truth is, not everyone wants to get well. Not everybody wants to get well. No wonder Jesus once asked a man, who is by a healing pool, hey, hey you, 
I got a question for you. Do you want to get well? Now we hear that statement and it sounds just crazy. We think, well, of course the man wants to be well. Of course he wants to be well. Why else would he be by this healing pool? Why else would he be in this place at this time? The statement makes no sense. Just like the statement that I've used with my kids before. When I've looked at them and said, do you want a spanking? And as if I almost expect them to say, well, yes, Father, I think I deserve it. I know that a good swat on my backside will correct so many things in my life and set me up for a bright future. Please, let me have it. You know, Jesus says, do you want to get well? Well, do you? Maybe the question is not as obvious as it appears. The man has been an invalid for 38 years. He's been crippled. That's 38 years of monotony. That's 38 years of futility. That's 38 years of self-loathing. That's 38 years of poisonous envy and secret pride. 38 years of never being able to work. 38 years of never being able to travel. 38 years never being able to make love. 38 years never to be able to cook to care for children, to fix an ox cart, to do all the things that everybody else at church does. 38 years. Do you want to get well? Because one word from Jesus, one word from Jesus in the last 38 years would be but a memory. One word from Jesus and everything stops. One word from Jesus and He will now be able to do all the things that before He could not do. There would be walking and there would be running. There would be dancing and there would be leaping. He could now pay His taxes. He could marry. He could have domestic responsibilities. He could build a house. He could fix a roof. He could go on a trip. He could do all the things that everyone else could do. But it would mean that he would have to relinquish that unique status that stuff, suffering bestows on a man. That anonymity that comes when you have to depend on everyone else. But now he would be like everybody else. We would expect things of him. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? You see, maybe the question is not so crazy after all. Maybe it's a question that pierces to the very depth of the man's soul. And what about us? I mean, what about us as we sit here today in church? As we have come here today, not really expecting much to happen. And Jesus looks at us crippled by problems, crippled by circumstances, crippled by sin, and he looks at you, and he looks at me, and he says, I got a crazy question. Do you want to get well? Do you want Jesus to heal the parts of your life where you have been damaged? Or is it easier to hold on to the hurt? Is it easier to let bitterness fester and to wallow in hurt and betrayal? You see, all too often we hold tightly to those things that paralyze us spiritually. Jesus can heal all those things, but when He does, we are then left with the, without all the excuses that we have been living with. I mean, after all, for so many years we've just become accustomed to the way that we talk, to the places that we go, to the lifestyle that we live, to the choices that we make. And restoration shocks the system. It turns everything up on its head. And now we look at our life and we say, who am I without this sin? Who am I without this paralysis? Who am I without these hurts and hang-ups? Who am I without my anger, without my bitterness? Who am I if I let go of everything that has defined me. 
Who am I if I take up my mat and go home? I'll no longer be able to cry out, my life's not my fault, it's somebody else's to blame. It's mom's fault, it's dad's fault, it's the office, it's Washington. It's the church. See, the question isn't that crazy, is it? When Jesus asks and says, do you want to get well? It's not a crazy question. To the one that's crippled by past hurts, Jesus says, do you want to be healed? I mean, really? Do you? To the one chained by secret sin, Jesus says, do you want to be set free? Do you want to be loosed? To the one battling addiction, Jesus says, do you want to overcome? Do you? To the one who has not yet given their life to Jesus, He says, do you want to be saved? I mean, really? Do you? You see, to all of us who need the healing touch in any part of our life, Jesus asked a very simple question. Do you want to be well? Do I want to get well? You see, that's the question that I have been wrestling with all week long. That's the question that I have been praying about. Because in order to get well, I have to ask myself, in what ways am I sick? And how have I grown content with that? How have I compensated for my sickness? How have I been able to compensate for the sin that I allow to stay in my life? I mean, so many of us, so many people that are here this morning in church, Long to get back to a place where we were only a few years ago. Where every day we heard the voice of God, it seemed. We were more vigilant then. We were more hungry, more expectant. Our pursuit for God had an end of the world desperation. It's like Rachel crying out to Jacob saying, Give me a child or I will die. We were crying out to God saying, God, give me your spirit. Heal me. Make me whole. Or I will die. We were spiritually lean, stealthy, and alert. And yet we were also vulnerable and wide open. We were a child and a warrior both, but somewhere we got dull. And the child got old. And the warrior became timid. And somewhere we started to play things safe. Somewhere we started to fall back on the tried and tired methods of doing the same things in the same ways. And we stopped asking God whether or not it was the time to go up and fight or to stay. We stopped asking God if we should go up or go down. We fell into a routine. And in the spring, when kings go out to war, we started to stay home, bored and restless on the palace roof looking for something, anything, to make us feel young again. And then Jesus comes and asks, do you want to get well? And we say, I think so. Maybe. See, the problem here is that we're afraid of what being well could mean. After all, we've been like we are for so long now. And so when Jesus asked the question, do you want to be made free from your past hurts? We reply, but Lord, you don't know how bad they hurt me. But you don't know how bad it hurt when they walked away. You don't know how bad it hurt when she said what she said. You don't know how bad it hurt when we divorced. When Jesus asks, do you want to be loosed from the chains of your secret sin? Do we counter, but Lord, I just can't control myself. You put these desires within me and I don't know how to to live without satisfying them. I mean, this is how you made me. When Jesus asks, when He says to the addict, do you want to overcome 
The answer often is I have an addiction and it's a disease and it's not my fault. It's not my fault I take this. It's not my fault that I drink this. It's not my fault that I'm in this condition. When Jesus asked, do you want to be saved? We excuse ourselves and we say, I'm not nearly as bad as other people are. I think I'm okay. I think everything is fine. Jesus said to the cripple, do you want to get well? And his reply was, I've got nobody to put me in the water. He had a moment. He had a moment where he's asked the question that for 38 years, for 38 years, if he had really wanted to get in the water, if he had really wanted the healing, the moment was here and now. Do you want to get well? And the best he can come back with is, I've got nobody that can help me. To receive the healing that Jesus has for our lives, We've got to put away the excuses. I mean, we must want things to change. But we also have to realize that not everybody wants to get well. Not everybody wants to be well. How else do you describe the fact that for the last eight years, your marriage has been in shambles? You've been coming to church. Sometimes you sit with your son alone. Sometimes you're all together as a family. Sometimes it's just you and your daughter. The last eight years, your marriage has been anything but holy. And yet you haven't gone to counseling. You haven't taken advantage of opportunities for healing. You've all but stopped praying that things could get different. You've had opportunities. But not everybody wants to get well. How else do you describe the apathy that you have in your life right now? You're here this morning, but you're not here. You're here because your parents asked you to come. You're here because your wife will give it to you if you don't come. You're here because, oh, you'll hear it from your mom and dad around the dinner table. They'll call you up and wonder why you weren't here with the grandkids. But you're apathetic. You're here, but you're not here. Because not everybody wants to be well. How else do you describe why for the last 15 years you've been struggling with pornography? Haven't sought out help. Haven't gone to counsel. You've tried to avoid any time of meditation and any time in the Word that might challenge you and what you're doing. You say, this is just how I have to live. This is what I need. It's not my fault. It's her fault. It's not my fault. It's his. <clears throat> but not everybody wants to get well, do they? How else do you explain the last four years? Your friends walked away from this family. And for the last four years, you have been angry. And you've been bitter. And you have refused to forgive. But not everybody wants to be well. How else do you describe how that you have been here and yet you have never chosen to give your life to Jesus Christ? You've heard sermon after sermon. You've been in Bible classes. 
You know that people have been praying for you by name. He refused to be baptized. He refused to turn from self and lay your life down at the feet of God. But some people just don't want to be well. Yet it seems that Jesus' favorite time to heal and restore was on church days. At least seven different times in scriptures you read where Jesus healed on the Sabbath, something that the religious at that time thought was a no-no. They would rather for someone to remain with a withered hand, with a crippled back, would rather for someone to remain, remain lame and maimed by the pool than to have them heal on the Sabbath day. But Jesus comes and he shakes everything up. That man that's in your midst with the withered hand, Jesus says, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But Mark chapter 3 and verse 4 says that everybody remained silent. And so he looked around at them in anger, in deeply distress, and at their stubborn hearts he said to the man, stretch out your hand. In Luke 13, he looks at the woman who is bent and says, should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Jesus asked his critics, who think that this kind of healing is better done during the week sometime, or along with the laundry, or when you're out bailing hay, or when you're out the stone quarry. He says, why can't this woman be healed in church? He looks at the man by the pool. And there on the Sabbath, when there's no work to be done, including the carrying of simple mats, and he says, get up and take the symbol of your brokenness and walk. It's unique, I think, that nowhere in these three different accounts do we find where the people came that day looking for healing. The man with the withered hand, he was in church but he wasn't expecting to leave different. And then Jesus gives him a command, an impossible command. He says, stretch out your hand. Oh, to be able to stretch it out. Oh, to be able to be healed. Oh, to be able to walk from this place and to know that you can no longer carry it around the burden anymore. He looks at the woman that has been over and tells her to straighten up. To be able to walk out of this place today straight without the guilt, without the burden that you brought in here? He looked at the man who offered excuse after excuse after excuse for 38 years and he gives him an impossible command. Stand up. And maybe it seems impossible for you today. Maybe it seems impossible for you to obey what Jesus is telling you. Maybe it seems impossible for you to turn away from the sin. It seems impossible for you to be renewed and to be restored. It seems impossible for you to forgive. It seems impossible for you to start over. It seems impossible for you to truly lay it all down at the feet of Jesus. But the man stretched out his hand and the woman stood up straight and the lame picked up his mat and walked. I know that there are many individuals here this morning, many who have been dealt with tragic illnesses. And I've spoken with you and I've prayed with you before and we have talked about the links that you are willing to go to in order to find healing. 
It, it, it never fails that whenever I speak to you and you're talking about the doctor or you're talking about the specialist or you're speaking specifically about the surgeon, you know what you always tell me? I've been put in touch with the best fill-in-the-blank of their field. It's the best doctor, it's the best specialist, it's the best surgeon. And if it wasn't the best, you know what? You would go find it. And some of you, you've gone into debt trying to make sure that you have the right drugs and you have the right treatments so that you might be able to expand life just a little bit longer to enjoy time with your husband, enjoy time on the golf course, enjoy time with your church, enjoy raising your kids. Because when we're given the disease and when it comes into our life and we realize that our health is failing we will cross any mountain we will swim any stream in order to be healed but church do you want to be spiritually well because we don't have a cure for cancer yet we don't have a cure for Crohn's disease and the common cold today can kill you just as easy as anything else. But we have a cure for the sin problem in your life. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? If so, why don't you let it be known? Why don't you run, not walk? We're going to sing a song to encourage one another. And why don't you come as a family? Why don't you come as a husband and wife? Why don't you come with your children? Why don't you come with your grandchildren? Come with your grandparents. Come. Maybe you need to confess sin this morning. Maybe you need to get specific with God and say, here is what I'm struggling with. Here is my hand. Here is my back. Here are my legs. Here is what's holding me back. Please take it away. Maybe you need to come this morning and you need to say, church, will you pray for me? Will you pray for my family? Will you give, pray that I will have strength? that I will have the courage to be able to speak the name of Jesus more boldly. Maybe you need to come this morning and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and because I believe with all my heart in the salvation by grace that comes through Him, I want to be washed and be made clean. Baptize me now. Jesus does crazy things when the church gets together. Will you... Let Him do something crazy in your life today. Do you want to get well? The answer to that question is where healing begins. Let us stand. <laughs>
I want you to know that while today's message focused specifically on the crazy things that Jesus did during the uh, Sabbath time when the Jews would come together to worship, that his healing was not excluded at any other times. And that while, yes, we have talked today about letting it be known whatever condition we might need healing, please understand that God's healing stands available at any time, day or night, and that we as a congregation stand here wanting to be able to be of assistance to anyone, whether you are a family member here at East Brainerd or whether you're just someone that has to, happens to be passing through. You need to know that our elders meet twice a month on a Monday evening, the first Monday and the third Monday of each month. And while during those times there is a lot of planning and different things that take place, please know that there is an opportunity available for you then if you would like to come and to have them pray with you, for you, if there's anything that you need to talk with them about. And those are just times that they get together regularly, but they are more than willing to be able to sit and talk with you at any time that you might need to call on them. Please know that my door is always open to you. My phone is always available. My email is ready to be answered. If there's anything that we can do for you to aid you on your spiritual journey, to aid in the healing that God has to offer, we ask that you take advantage of that. So seek us out if we might be able to suggest a counselor. Seek us out if we might be able to open up scripture and study with you. Seek us out if we might be able to sit down with you, with our arms around you, and pray for you and your family. We are here. We all need to be well. And through God's grace and mercy, we can be. Thanks again, Chris, for a very encouraging, spirit-led lesson. I'd add to that that if you think you can do this by yourself, I would almost quite guarantee that you will fail. I've been at that point in time where I thought I could take care of some of my sin issues by myself, and I failed. Maybe I succeeded for a little bit, maybe a year or two, but then I'd fail. Please talk to someone. It's not worth failing. We are so glad you're here. If you're visiting with us today, you're our honored guest. Please stop by our Welcome Center, and we would love to guide you in a direction for uh, our classes that follow, as well as uh, small group opportunities that, uh, and Sunday night gatherings that we have here every week. Please uh, stand uh, before we're dismissed to our Bible classes. I stand to praise you. Oh, 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 oh.
Please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you today thanking you for blessing us and uh, being with us and loving us. I pray you can give us strength as we finish out the uh, school year and the summer is coming upon us. Uh, we thank you for letting your son die for our sins, giving us a second chance at life. I pray that you uh, help us to always know that you love us no matter what. And uh, please also give us the strength to ask for when we are, help, uh, for when we are hurting and that you can help us. Uh, please be with everyone who is sick right now, injured, and in need of you. And please, Lord, help us to live missionally. Help us to remember that we are your children, that you love us, and that you are all pleased with us no matter what. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.